This episode is brought to you in part by the Calliopeia Foundation and listeners like you. Calliopeia supports projects interweaving spirituality, culture, and ecology. We are grateful for their support and for the support of grassroots contributions from listeners. To learn more about Calliopeia Foundation, visit calliopeia.org. To make a donation to For the Wild, visit forthewild.world slash donate and support us through Patreon. Welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Today on the show, I'll be speaking with Kenrick McDowell, who has worked at the intersection of culture and technology for over 20 years. Kenrick co-leads the Artist and Machine Intelligence Program at Google, where he facilitates collaboration between artificial intelligence researchers, artists, and cultural institutions. Kenrick is a regular conference speaker and consultant to think tanks and arts organizations, helping groups connect artistic practice and technology production with larger traditions of human understanding. Well, Kenrick, I am so grateful to be in conversation with you again. It's so wonderful to be able to have dear friends on the podcast. I really enjoy these conversations so much. And last September, you invited me to the Guggenheim where you facilitated a dialogue on art and technology in the age of the Anthropocene, alongside support from Troy Conrad Therian, curator of architecture and digital initiatives at the Guggenheim. So this is such a wonderful way to reconnect, and thank you so much for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you, Ayanna. Thanks uh, for inviting me to be on. It was, it's been a great experience meeting you and being in a conversation and the Guggenheim event was a really profound shift for the type of conversations I've been able to have in public. And so I'm really looking forward to continuing. I want to give the audience a little bit of context to our chat at the Guggenheim. And we were in the lobby. And for those of you who know the space, it's this incredible rotunda you know, it's just, and so we were all in this circle sitting on the floor. It was really, it was really deep. And in this space, you asked all of us involved to think about the role that technology plays in relating to our habitat and the future, as well as whether or not technology can reintroduce slowness and renewal in our relationships. The thing that I came to as Part of the, a stream of work that happened early uh, in AMI where we started working with philosophers to bring them in and help us understand like what AI really was, what we were projecting onto it as a culture, was to understand how much design processes have embedded a certain set of beliefs about what a human is and what relationships are. And so we're doing some research now based on the idea that our current models really need refactoring. And I think we have some like really strong keywords to, to discuss about things that could be refactored, but I want to kind of start from where we're working, which is to say, and this is partly like my selfish motivation for getting this event together, is to like get these ideas out to people and see what comes back from our community. But to say that when we think about design right now, we think about software, we're thinking about essentially this is the conduit, which is a, an interface to an individual person who has an email address, a credit card, and a shipping address, right? So there's a certain degree to which we've like internalized this alienated model. We're not thinking about relationality and one of the things that comes up when you start looking at AI and pattern recognition is the ways that patterns can be perceived that maybe not weren't intended to be perceived. So, you know, relationality we think is a really important aspect of any kind of design paradigm. So if we were going to reframe our thinking around design, we would move through relationality into our interspecies relationships and into ecological ways of thinking. So given that like we're people that are very much embedded within this urban infrastructure, it's not really something that we're all gonna do. We're not gonna all be able to follow the path that you took, but we, what, what we can do is work from our own backyards and start by looking at the disciplines that we're engaged in and figuring out how we're reproducing embedded ideologies that were given to us about consumerism, entitlement, our sort of like alienation from each other, from relationships, from our companion species, and from the ecosystems that we are living in. So to back up just a little bit before moving on, you know, I see you working in a very like interspecies context, right? And you were able to reflect to me how the individual species, when one collapses, all of the others collapse with it. 
that's one really important piece of the puzzle. And there were some other things that really speak to some of the discourse going on in tech right now, right? Like solutionism. We were talking about the need to reframe concepts of solving, saving, and the idea of a solution. Um, and I think this is a space that might be tractable for people here, is to sort of like figure out how we can use our understanding of our disciplines to reframe some of these concepts broadly and in general for the culture at large. And I guess what I'm arguing for is like people that work with ideas, people that work with design, really that's, where, that's the tool that we have. I really believe we need to come together to discuss these questions regardless of our personas as artists, designers, engineers, or ecologists, etc. Because we're all thinking about ecological collapse and resilience, and the time is really ripe for fostering relationships in these incredibly polarizing spaces. So... To begin, I'm hoping we can acknowledge the extreme polarities when it comes to common opinions on technology and ecology, and perhaps you can share what fed your desire to tend to the intersection of these realms. Yeah, first of all, to say I, I couldn't agree more that now is the time for us to be having these conversations about our shared stake in technology and ecology. There may have been a time when the impact of technology wasn't felt globally, but that's not the case anymore. And the same goes for the ecological crisis. This is, these are things that bring all of us together because we can't draw clear lines of ownership or responsibility for, you know, we can draw, we can draw lines of ownership and responsibility, but they ultimately include all of us. The situation that we're in ultimately includes all of us. And so it's really important for us to be having this conversation and these conversations around these things that, that belong to all of us. The question of how I came to be interested in this, I came into public speaking and conversation largely through my role as a facilitator of collaboration between artists and AI researchers and being at the intersection of culture and AI research, it quickly became clear how many complex ethical, moral, social factors come into play in the creation of technology and in the deployment of technology and the use of technology. So being involved in research, it became, it became clear that there was a responsibility to bring voices into the research process that could raise those concerns because the production of technology is largely been done by people who are trained in technology and it's it can be a very narrow educational lens if it's if there isn't some effort put in to broaden it so we started bringing artists and philosophers in not just to produce their own projects but to consult our strategy teams and to help us think on a deeper level about the assumptions that we bring to the production of technology and to researching technology so we've done workshops with philosophers around ontology that led us to expand our definition of a user and to question our assumptions about why we might only think about humans as users. And in that process, it became really clear that we could start unpacking issues that were coming from other directions involving ecology um, through the discourse of technology production and through understanding the assumptions that we've brought to it because those assumptions of human centricity are not only in the realm of technology they exist everywhere and so if we wanted to have a true philosophical investigation of our practice as makers of technology we have to unpack concepts that have been given to most of the people in our community from other places not just from technology training so that became a platform for exploring ways of understanding who the users of technology were ways of understanding our assumptions about human centricity and supremacy and ultimately inevitably forced us to think about ecology mm -hmm. 
Well, thank you for that introduction. And I'd like to give the listeners a bit more context to our conversation last September. And to ground the conversation for the listeners, I'd like to discuss the origins of human-centered design, especially as it relates to computing and machine learning. So I'm wondering if you could sort of summarize the trajectory of human-centered design and speak to the initial necessity of a somewhat countercultural hyper-focus on human potential, as well as how human-centered design inherently limits relationability and interspecies connection. Yeah. Human-centered design originated in the 70s as a response to engineered systems that didn't account for usability, for accessibility, or for basic, basically allowing humans to feel comfortable while using these devices. So the notion of prioritizing human users in a machine at context was really important for making technologies accessible to people with different abilities, to making them easy to use, to making them safe. But now we're in a context where human-centered design is predominant. And so user experience design, for example, often makes use of human-centered methods of research and trying to understand what our intuitive reactions are to things, how to make things more accessible to all potential users. At the same time that human-centered design has become the predominant paradigm, we also have the reframing of our geological era as the Anthropocene. And there's really, if you look at it from a very basic linguistic point of view, these things have something in common, right? Which is that the human is at the center. As we start to introduce machine learning and artificial intelligence technologies into these technological systems, we find that they have a capacity for recognizing patterns of behavior, for find, recognizing patterns across systems. And as we start to consider possibilities for using them spatially, for example, within architecture, we have to think about the users, human users, in a relational context, meaning if a pattern recognizing machine learning system that tries to understand what it observes sees people interacting, it will inevitably understand their relationality because it's inherent in the situation. Or maybe not inevitably, but ideally it will understand their relationality because we've entered our current design paradigm, the human-centered design paradigm, really from an individualistic entry point, which comes from a consumer model. But the systems that we live in are not individualistic, they're relational. So when we start to think about human-centered design in a relational way, if we think deeply about that, we will inevitably realize that our relations are not just between humans. And this is where questions around ecology come in and questions around types of intelligence, non-human intelligence that animals and plants have as machines gain some abilities that remind us of human intelligence, we can start to recognize that intelligence might not just be a human trait. And in fact, it exists all around us. So as these systems that learn start to try to understand us and to model the inherent relationality of the users that have been current up until now framed as individuals, there's a necessary expansion of the human center that really comes from the nascent abilities of machine learning. It doesn't, and I'm not saying that this is an inevitable outcome. This is something that we have a chance to shape now, but the convergence of this emerging capability within technology and the ecological and extinction crisis as framed by the Anthropocene term really brings to the forefront the notion that the human at the center is a limiting concept from which to be designing. Whew. Preach that, Kenrick. <laughs> That's so, I definitely agree with that. And it's, gosh, every time I speak with you, I feel like I'm transported into a whole other world that my mind is usually not hanging out in. And so 
Yeah, I feel like I'm hanging on every word, really trying to get into this other way of understanding. It's so deep. And I'm remembering the sentiments you shared as you opened up our dialogue at the Guggenheim, which in my mind is a call to de-anthropocentrize design. So I'm wondering if you can share what you see the implications are of continuing narratives of anthropocentrism when it comes to machine learning, technology, and design, both within the field itself and in context to the extinction crisis. Yeah, the anthropocentric narrative within design of technology, software, and of machine learning really has a root in consumerist worldview. So if you take your phone and you look at what does your phone believe that you are, it sees you as a series of taps on the screen. And for most of the software on there, it sees you as an email address, a shipping address, and a credit card. And that individual, the assumptions about that individual, the assumptions about what a human is, that a human is that individual, and that that is what the definition of an individual is, those assumptions are really deeply baked into so much of our culture that it's really hard to escape them when thinking about potentially more complex systems like machine learning. So when we propose that we might expand the human center of design thinking, we confront not just the problem of thinking of ourselves as the center of the world, which we've inherited through various traditions, but also thinking of the the human center as an individual center, as a consumer center. We have to really undo multiple layers of thinking to get there. And one of the challenges that surfaces these multiple layers of thinking is when thinking about a design paradigm that would include non-humans, plants, animals, elements, ecosystems, it's very hard for us to imagine because none of those entities have credit cards or bank accounts and they can't pay for things. And this is one of the fundamental challenges is how do we, if we want to expand the human, we have to expand the human beyond our consumptive ability and our existence within the economic system, even thinking about humans relationally does that to a certain extent. But when we expand to relations that don't exist within that system, then it challenges the framework of that system. And so we've had experts come in to speak to us about ecosystem services, economic models, how those work, how people try to quantify the use value of an ecosystem, which in this context sounds really profane, but then within the context of economic modeling, there's no representation of those systems. And their questions arise in our engagements, our academic and philosophical engagements around what does it mean to try to represent those things economically? Should that be done? Can it be done? Does quantification of ecology, is that a wise thing for us to be doing? Is it even possible to model and understand ecology on a certain level of granularity it is, but you know, I'm not talking about scientific research. I'm talking about building urban frameworks, building infrastructure. How does quantification or the attempt to quantify the real or nature in those contexts, how does that introduce errors into our own modeling? How does it, you know, an example that came up recently in a class was someone was asking about personhood and certain ideas that with technology, natural environments might attain some kind of digital representation, but that immediately brings to mind the question of what it takes in terms of resources, in terms of computation to actually represent these things and whether it's worth spending those resources to try to do that, to try to integrate them into the system. And ultimately, if modeling, computing, ecology is done from the point of view of profit-seeking entities, will it become just another mechanism for control?
as I fly over treetops to my home, home at the top of the mountain of song to fountain of wind. I've been in my own world struggling with this concept of quantifying. And in the nonprofit industrial complex, <laughs> in the world of the nonprofit, there's a lot of desire or even requirements to quantify impact. And it's really challenging when something like impact or relationships or the natural world is kind of confined or conformed in a quantifiable model, so much seems to be lost. And I don't think the things that are lost, I, you know, my first reaction is they'll never be able to be quantified in a type of human-created system because it's something beyond that. And that unquantifiable whatever it is, energy, relationship, plant, whatever it is, it's, it's like, that's, that's magic. That's something that in a way I feel like we shouldn't even seek to fully understand because we never will. But then I also am hearing what you're saying and, and wondering, is this something that we even want to try to integrate into these systems? And I definitely do not have the answer, but it's a really, yeah, it's a good mental gymnastics workout. And I feel like in order to design differently, I'm gleaning that there are like two areas that we really want to attune ourselves to if we want to negate our anthropocentric tendencies. One being that design needs to take place in recognition of relationships, identifying that all users as relational beings. And then the other being that we must broaden our understanding of intelligence or maybe perhaps abolish our metrics of it altogether. So within the realm of design and technology, can you speak to these tightly tethered connections between creation, relationship, and intelligence? Mm -hmm. What you're saying about relationship, I think is, I think this is really the key to understanding, for example, the, what you're talking about with the unquantifiability of certain aspects of being, basically. If we, open ourselves up to learning from cultures that have a more balanced relationship with nature, I think we'll find that the idea of quantification or the idea of understanding is mitigated through a type of relation. So a relation of humility in the face of nature and also a relation of openness to not just the unknowability, but the novelty of nature. So whether through ritual or narrative worldviews, there are precedents for relating to nature in a way that allows it to be as infinite as it really is. Having said that, there is this deep drive within our culture to understand through metrics. And I guess my hope is that we can build a relational way of understanding, measuring that allows us to stay open to the infinite novelty of nature and open in a humble way to the unquantifiability of it. Meaning we won't try to produce a totalizing rational system that erases the mystery, but actually we can still use those systems in some productive way while knowing that we are working with a model without making our models total. And that ability, the ability to do that really, I think has a lot to do with how we include 
other models in our thinking, right? So if we're building up this kind of total, perfect, quantified, rational understanding, it's often for the purpose of a single point of view. And I think the first step relationally is to open up to other points of view to begin thinking, you know, for example, I've done some work with the philosopher Yukui, who's got a very productive framework for thinking through technology, which he calls cosmotechnics and builds on the idea that technologies embed their cosmology in them as they're propagated. He's looking at it from an East West perspective and looking at the way that Western technologies are entering China and proposing ways that China might embed its own mythos or ethos or belief into the production of technology there, but the same could be applied on a north-south axis on multiple axes. And when we start to diversify the points of view around modeling, then we can start to see that each of those models has different priorities and that one of them isn't the perfect one. So there may be an ability to enrich our modeling while understanding its limitations. I think that's really the core of a lot of this is understanding limitation and accepting limitation and accepting that our own limitations provide an experience. By accepting our own limitations, we can have an experience that goes beyond those limitations, but we can't believe that our models are going to be perfect. Hmm. There's this question that has come up for me. Gosh, I don't even know how to really put into words, but it's interesting as humans how we're constantly searching for something. And I and maybe also as as modern humans, this search is so much outside of ourselves and our community and our relationship to the land. And yeah, just trying to understand things in this rational reductionist way to maybe feel comforted thinking that we know something or, you know, I'm just trying to, I, I'm like feeling this existential question come up around even just the desire to try to fit these complex ways of being into models and what is that going to get us? Where, where are we trying to even go once we think we understand something in a way that we can categorize and quantify and, and so on and so forth? And and while I really want to embrace this call for a relational model, part of me is torn in that I, I question whether or not these holistic models improve well-being for our benefit or ultimately just aid in the selling and consuming of services and products, something that you mentioned a bit before, and whether or not that distinction even needs to be made. So yeah, I guess what this gnaws at is is this larger question I have around whether or not an ecosystem-centered field of AI or machine learning is compatible with capital, or will the field of technology ultimately prioritize the creation of systems that generate a profit. I totally agree with the the existential question that you're pointing to. I think, you know, partly there's a few things that I think we're seeking in trying to like understand or map. One of them is a sort of existential security or control. And one of the lessons I've learned over and over is that you don't have control and (laughs) you can't have control. And uh, I think this is really on a, on a deeper level beyond the questions of how to implement anything in technology or whether we should, this is the, this is the question is how to be in relationship with life and the earth in a way without needing to be in control, without needing to know what's going on necessarily. Really, how do we actually just be? And that deep anxiety that many people feel around that is, is is expressed exactly as as you've been describing it. I think another thing that we're looking for and trying to maybe reproduce through technology is embedding within a social context and embedding within a terrestrial context. And those things, if they're not present, we won't be able to produce something meaningful or helpful with technology if we're erasing those things or not, or if those needs are not met. So I share your concern. I share the experience of that tension of, you know, 
we can build a more holistic model. We can think through these questions in a more ecological way. But if we are unable to be without controlling or knowing or resting in the mental model that we've created, if we can't just be, we'll produce that anxiety again through our technologies. And if we don't have social webs, if we don't have relationships terrestrially, if we don't exist in a web of life, then we will also reproduce all of those same problems. And in many ways, these provocations or these proposals, you know, I work in strategy and in many ways I work at the edge of what strategy can do. So these proposals are radical in the sense that they, you know, the, the team that I'm working with is very interested in proposing radical alternatives that challenge deep assumptions. And one of the lessons of working in strategy is that the majority of what you do is probably not going to be realized. So speaking about these things or putting this out there is a way to surface the complexity and to stay with the trouble rather than maybe in actually putting forward these radical proposals might show us the limitations of what we're able to produce within the currently existing system. And working in strategy, you have to come to terms with the fact that a lot of what you propose or do will not be realized. So these are ways of breaking apart our thinking that that they may not be perfect solutions. I want to shift this conversation to discuss the culture wherein tech is cultivated and how this impacts design. And perhaps we can do this as a precursor to discussing the need to slow down, which is something we've talked about a lot in our personal conversations. And I'm thinking a lot about how the culture of the machine learning and technological advancement has been cultivated in a space that has and continues to really repress the sacred in all of its embodiment. And as well as how the culture of tech today is hyper-focused on efficiency, so much so that it denies us the luxury and the beauty of waiting, patience, slowness, and honestly, even boredom. So perhaps you can share what you think this means for bridging ecology and technology in terms of surrendering the quarterly model based on immediate gratification and reviving something slower and more long-term. And where do you find the practice of slowing down? Well, you pointed directly to it at the end of the question by talking about the quarterly model. A lot of times the scenarios that say engineers or designers find themselves in are ones where they're in competition with each other to perform and the way that that's understood is through metrics. And the easiest metrics to, to point to are the ones that speed things up or make things more efficient. But when we think about what even just the Anthropocene framing is presenting to us, it's a picture of humanity existing at a certain time scale or our actions existing at a certain time scale. And the confrontation with that almost unimaginable length of time that so many of these materials that we've produced will have the time scale at which our actions are living now really challenges the quarterly model. It's almost too hard to think. So our strategy team has been thinking about what framework could we use to start to think about different temporal scales. And so, you know, I'm really answering not from the personal side, but from the professional side, like how do we actually address short-term thinking? And we have a framework where we kind of make a grid with at the top spatial scales with the human at one point, but the ecosystem at another point, the microorganism at another, and then temporal scales with the human lifespan, maybe in the middle and geologic time at one end and the life cycle of a bacterium or something at another end. And we've been producing these workshops where we help people use this framework to challenge the way that they're thinking about design. But again, the quarterly model is a profit one. It's based on quarterly reports, economic reports. And 
what I've seen working in the cultural sector is that even cultural projects need much more time than a corporation will allow. So you need a couple of years to see a project really through. And just the introduction of that notion that like we actually are building something bigger here has been productive, but it's a, something that you have to kind of concentrate your effort on doing. And I've seen even within our team, like as we've started to think this way, we've shifted a little bit our focus on a day-to-day level of how to work, meaning let's allocate more time for deeper work and less time for shorter meetings, et cetera. Um, so there are lots of small ways to do that, as well as strategic ways for thinking what is the impact of this product that we're working on in not just a quarter or a year, but 10 years or its full life cycle, including the materials that it's made from. And I'm working with a colleague on some metric systems now that where we're attempting to introduce those in a systematic way into a kind of prospective product analysis. I have had to reprioritize and really focus on which aspects of work, my own work, personally, creatively, professionally, like how all of those things, which aspects are really rewarding me in a sustainable way, because there's a lot of needs to be met. And working at the intersection of these different spaces, there's a lot of opportunity to be present. But ultimately, as an individual, I need a deeper sustaining resource. And so getting deeper into my own practices that provide that for me has been a way to slow down and to to learn to see opportunities against a longer time scale, just within my own personal lifespan, or even within like a five to 10 year personal time cycle. But also like that does build up to understanding where your energetic investment is and how that might, how you might begin to think intergenerationally as a starting point for moving beyond your own time span. I think the slowing down in design and and how you were saying that a lot of the strategy that is created doesn't always get implemented. And part of me thinks good. Even in my own projects, I'm always grateful when I spend a lot of time strategizing and researching and development and don't always take the physical steps to actually realize it because not everything needs or should be realized at this time because everything takes resources. And I think it's part of this instant gratification, consumptive stranglehold addiction, whatever we want to call it to think of something and then implement it almost immediately. And that is really dangerous in so many different ways, whether we think the project we're creating is benign or not. And yeah, I appreciate that slowness in thinking things through and thinking about future generations, because I think that definitely is something we've lost in this dominant Western model, that it's all about now and it's all about what we can see directly in front of us. And that has been really detrimental. And I (laughs) have been thinking about along with slowness, how we can turn to play and design. And I feel like one of the greatest interventions might be restoring playfulness into practice. And so I'm wondering 
what does this look like to you in terms of creating technologies that embody care? And even perhaps, yeah, how can technologies even embody care? That's a really good question. When you think about care and I think play as well, there is an inherent relation in there, right? Like when we care, we care for an other and we can care for ourselves as well, but often it's for an other. And maybe the key to starting to understand technology in that way is to see it as something that has the potential for shaping relations, right? I mean, we've lived through this era of social media so far and relations have been shaped in a certain direction through design priorities that emphasize uh, visibility and exposure and likes and uh, impressions and stuff like that. But there is a relational element to that. And could we bring care into something that has this inherent uh, relational structure built into it? I think whatever it is that, however that happens, it care happens relationally. So it's, it's going to need to exist there. I can see like within architecture opportunities to consider care and relation of the users of architecture. This is a space where environments can be hostile. They can be easy to use. They can provide for our needs. They can be full of care. And this is one area where the, where, you know, I've been working with academics in architecture for a while. And this seems to be an area where there could be some interesting engagement with technology or that there will inevitably be an engagement with technology. So the question becomes then how do we make that a good one? I do just on a very basic level, like spatially, the challenge of architecture when it comes to computing is that the user isn't the individual that you kind of see through the phone camera. It's a group of people. And that implies these elements like care being present and these elements of sociality. One of the things that keeps coming to mind is some research I saw recently pointing to the need for social embedding and for networks of care in absorbing climate change understanding. So, you know, I can see opportunities at the intersection of architecture, design, creation of technologies that would take into account sociality and help provide frameworks for coexisting with other people that could help mitigate some of these, some of the information that we're having to understand or some of the understanding we're having to absorb, help us deal with the current context. And I haven't spoken much about play, which is something that's in your question. I mean, that's really how I came into this space of working with AI was by working with artists and seeing their playful relations with AI. I mean, there's also critical relations. There's also poetic relations within artistic use of AI, but what really is obvious when you bring an artist into the research setting or the corporate setting is that their impulse is playful in comparison to the type of normal motivations of research. There's some play involved in it, sure, but in general, their artists come in and say, well, couldn't we do this? And then people are like, well, why would we do that? And they're like, well, just because, you know, that's what I want to do. That seems like that's what's interesting here. That would be a fun thing to do. That would be a weird thing to do. That would be a beautiful thing to do. And those modes of operating and those those motivations are 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 not very present in a lot of technology production. So, you know, having artists come in to show us the fact that we're not doing those things has actually been very helpful. Mm-hmm. It's like play challenges efficiency. And I appreciate that in some ways, just to kind of shake us out of the forward motionness of work. And yeah, thank you for speaking to that. And also in preparing for this interview, I came across an instance where you explained your responsibility to the sector of work and that it's both careless and a privilege to back away from this realm altogether. And so often we hear conversations where it's proclaimed that we don't need this. We don't need any of what technology or artificial intelligence has to offer us. And why even bother with it? And perhaps there is a great deal of truth to that, but that doesn't change the fact that we have it, that society has given birth to this age, to machine learning, that 
we're just as dependent upon these intelligence systems as we are to fossil fuels. So I'd love to ask you to speak to your own journey when it comes to grappling with the responsibility that we have to the likes of artificial intelligence. Yeah, it's funny to think about like, when you ask about like my own journey, I guess I'll just share this story. It's a little personal, but I remember I had come from New York and driven out West. I'd given away everything I owned and moved into a van with my partner and driven out West. And this was 2011 and ended up after settling in a few different places in Seattle. And I was sitting outside of a place where I was working, which was a you know, I was going through this thing where I was like really questioning like money at all, you know, like what, how does it even exist? Like what, <laughs> why? And through circumstance ended up having to get a uh, job at a place that lent money to JP Morgan. So fate was really kind of like giving me these like polar experiences. And I was outside of that place. I was smoking some tobacco and contemplating like all the things I had done in my life and feeling like I had kind of washed ashore and like run aground and feeling really kind of without agency. And I really questioned what I cared about. And I really cared about changing the system that I was in. And I had been making an active effort to drop out of it as much as I could, and it wasn't successful. And so at that point, I decided to, I had been a freelance software engineer for about 17 years, probably at that point. And I decided to go get a job in product design because I felt rather than becoming an activist in a conventional sense, I didn't really have any capacity to do that in specific, but I could go into design and I had a pretty high degree of agency in that because of the work I had been doing. So that was the point for me where I sort of, I guess, took responsibility for the career that I'd created or really committed to being an agent of change within that system was after a sort of half-hearted maybe attempt to pull myself out of it and realizing that like there was no outside to my experience as a participant in capitalism as much as I would have liked there to be. Like I was really just reducing my agency within it. And so that was how I personally came to that, but I agree it's a a little bit of a chicken and an egg scenario where you're like, should we be fixing this? Should we be stopping it? And there is power in computation. There is the ability to do more. And so the question of like what it is that we do with it is really important and in many ways goes unasked or gets masked by the nascent ideology or the latent ideology of Silicon Valley, which has roots in the counterculture, which has roots in the human potential movement, and often kind of presents its utopian face. You know, I think in the last few years, we understand how flimsy that is. But for decades, it was a the Silicon Valley ideology was able to sort of surf on its countercultural credentials that somehow imbued it with at least a humanistic good. So yeah, there's a lot to take responsibility for as a participant within that. And I guess maybe one question it's important to ask ourselves is, am I a victim in this situation? Am I subjected to these things? And where is my agency in how I interact with them? You know, when it comes to like social media, for example, it's something I've like largely quit using. You know, I do use Twitter to keep up with news and things like that. But I, I found that as I pull out of it more and more, my own engagement was was what was producing the ability for me to be manipulated by it. And there's obviously reasons to use those tools. And I think an important skill for us all to develop is to understand like when manipulation is happening and to learn how to not participate in our own manipulation. I was snapping for you in my mind <laughs> with that. I such an important point to understand how we are feeding our own manipulation or feeding into the things that we feel victimized by. And I do think there are things that are by systemic design and we are in a sense 
controlled by it outside of ourselves. And then I also know that we are the ones who also keep the machine churning because we keep buying into it in multiple different ways. And so balancing those two sides of knowing that there is systematic oppression happening and also knowing that we all have responsibility, especially as modern, for those of us who are in the dominant culture are feeding into this system that we also want to take down simultaneously. And it's so challenging, especially I know for a lot of activists out there who, and I know for myself too, I do live a modern life and I do have an iPhone and I do have social media. And sometimes I feel so thrashed by it. And there's a lot of guilt, a lot of frustration, but also a lot of convenience And a lot of things that I have become so accustomed to having and sitting in that discomfort is really important for our growth, for those of us who want to see through this. And I think the points you made around, yeah, responsibility and manipulation are just so at the core of what we need to be considering when we decide to kind of create our belief systems around these larger narratives and, and, uh, yeah, elements of control. And I think we also need to recognize that AI is, is to talk more about AI is it's still being developed and it's not fixed. So, and, and I guess technology in general. So I think we need to recognize that AI is still being developed and it's not fixed. So as we near the end of this conversation, which I wish could last forever, I would really love to ask you about your work with artists and machine intelligence as an interdisciplinary liminal space that is very much committed to the exploration of machine intelligence and relationship. And yeah, do you think that deepening this relationship addresses the damning narratives put forth around AI and technology as a hazard to our health and humanity? And if so, what work needs to be done to ensure that the relationships being tended will also address the reality that AI already poses a substantial threat to marginalized populations and those who already experience the greatest burdens of inequality? Well, Artists and Machine Intelligence has been a site for these interdisciplinary conversation. It has been a liminal site and it's allowed voices to critique and to be heard and to express new possibilities that definitely would not have come about in a traditional research context. Now, is that changing things? On some level, it probably is, but it's a cultural program and culture art as something that represents or addresses certain things isn't necessarily that empowered within the tech world. So there's a discursive freedom that we have, and there's an ability to critique and to generate new ideas that certainly has an impact. And I I can say that like the leadership in the group that I'm in have really had transformative experiences in conversation with artists and philosophers that have changed their approach. And would I like to see more of that in every in every tech context? Absolutely. Do I think that it's enough to right the ship? I don't. There's lots of on the ground work to be done with representation within tech companies and bringing voices into the process, hiring people that naturally have different experience from the majority of tech creators. Those are fundamental things that we can't ignore that will help. And I think the questions, there are questions that go much deeper than AI in specific that need to be addressed, but AI will help us surface. AI is for many people a mirror of belief, meaning that the cultural image of a powerful mind that doesn't seem to have a body that has some ability to control our environment in some way is essentially a god. And people have projected all kinds of different things onto AI as as a, a sort of mirror of their own belief. And this, I think, is a very powerful function of AI as a rhetorical tool and as a cultural device. It also becomes a mask for it to wear 
and the true making of it is much different than that. But when people come to this technological context, when people talk about AI and they bring up, it brings up these assumptions, that's a good site to intervene or to discuss like why those assumptions are there. When people imagine a sort of all-powerful singular AI that watches all and has punitive abilities and knows everything, they're really reflecting a certain construction of what a deity is. And it's really important to understand like why we bring those beliefs to the table when we talk about AI, because that's what's happening all over. For everyone that's making it, these beliefs, these implicit beliefs are being brought to something that can have a lot of capacity for receiving projection. So, you know, there's so much to be done, but how we do it and from what set of assumptions we're doing it, it's really critically important to surface and to understand. And one way of doing that is by being in diverse relationships with people that have different views than our own. So different views from their own life experience and different views of, of different assumptions that they bring to these, to this mirror of AI. Mm. So interesting to think of the belief systems we put on technology, this godlike figure. It's really, yeah, I think I had thought about that before, but hearing you say it really stuck with me this time. And the last area that I want to revisit from our talk is on grief as a portal, but now even more so than before, because I'm thinking about the complexity of this grief and the opportunity of this complexity, how the earthly experience, as I was reminded at the Guggenheim, is never solely benevolent. It is imperfect. It's chaotic at times, and it's always intertwining. And I see so much similarity between that complexity and the discourse around technology. So in closing, I'd love to ask you how you navigated this complexity, especially as someone who remains really committed to straddling the worlds between magic, ecology, and technology. I guess when it comes to navigating and straddling worlds, you know, a couple I guess grounding points come to mind. One thing I haven't really spoken a lot about is politics, but I think trying to bring all of these other dimensions of experience into lived reality rather than maybe like a purely rhetorical space requires grappling with very complex systems, whether they be technical or political and appreciating the mundane and the inherent trickiness of all of that and bringing it from theory really as participating in the process of creation is a way of bringing these theories and these ideas into practical embodiment. And that I find very grounding that there are these constraints that are technical, there are constraints that are political. And at the end of the day, something is going to happen and something will be made. And knowing, you know, rather than pretending that those constraints aren't there, like allowing them to be helpful or allowing them to scope down the sort of like infinite possibility or chaos potentially of all of this is, I guess, part of the practice for me. I know a lot of academics and that's a really important piece of it too, but I'm trying to bring this into, into reality uh, against these contexts, I think, is, is also very grounding for me. And then the other thing that comes to mind is really just drawing from my own experiences through meditation, through working with plants that have shown me how much more there is to reality than kind of what we do experience on the mundane day-to-day -day level and trying to stay grounded in non-dual awareness, trying to stay grounded in awareness that there's more happening than what we can see while at the same time staying grounded in that awareness is that's something I that's something I check in with every day. But it's also something that is made more meaningful by having these contexts of mundane reality to enrich. 
And we do, I believe, need to find deeper connections with one another and with the earth in order to make any decisions that have a holistic approach to them. And I do think we need more holistic approaches. You know, we're, we're up against a lot, but when we come together and we're able to be more fully engaged in what is, like the, the solutions and the brainstorms that can come out of that and the friendships <laughs> is beautiful. Like I, I, I think about that all the time. When I let the grief in, of course, like I'm, I feel so much grief and pain and overwhelm, but at the same time, the amount of pleasure, connectivity, love, beauty that I'm able to take in at the same time, it, it's not that they cancel each other out, it's just that I'm actually able to become a more expansive and open human in that way. And, and so, yeah, I mean, there, there's so much to it and I could, you know, ramble on, but I'll, I'll pause there. And... Well, yeah, I mean, something you said about processing this grief and letting it sort of transform your life is really critical, I think, for people that are trying to negotiate these problems through their practice. And if you're, even if your practice is large-scale infrastructure or architecture or media, there's a need to understand the situation clearly. And like, I think there's a lot of tendency towards abstraction within the disciplines that, like, for example, I engage with. And I think a lot of people here, there's a need to be very abstract. Like, as a policymaker, you need to be very abstract to deal with the scales of human life that you're influencing. As a technologist, you have to be abstract for obvious technical reasons as well. But there's something about um, letting yourself move through this process so that you can see more clearly what you're working with. And I think there's a, what I got from some of the conversations we had is that we are a little trapped in the models of the world that we have, that we are afraid of letting go of the model because it means we have to experience some pain, collective pain. But as we do that, once we let go of the model, once we experience it and process it, we can move into a space where we have a better vision of what's going on. And when we can see more clearly, we can actually start to act with real agency and real effect. Because right now, we're, if we don't process it, we're kind of beating against this kind of model of the world so that we don't have to be like in the presence of this grief, right? And we, the way you described it uh, when we were talking was that that transformative process, I mean, for me, it was something that happened over like 10 years, but really only very recently did I find a way into thinking with my own discipline. And it became like what you described, it was a portal to joy or to beauty or to agency or new types of creativity. And this portal, I think, is the promise of this climate grief experience. I mean, collectively, obviously, but also individually too, right? Or maybe vice versa. Like maybe it's more obvious for the individual, but the collective, when we all in mass like take it on through a synthesis of using our systemic analytical understanding, which is so highly developed amongst many of the people here and the people that we know, and our sort of like experiential need to like engage with the earth as a living thing, to sort of surrender to these like larger forces and not be sort of the master of reality, then perhaps that portal is the way, you know, that's like the thing we need to keep our, our eyes on as we go through the process, mm -hmm. because it's, I think it's also like grieving, it's a fractal process, right? Like, it, you go through a certain part of it, and then a year later, you're kind of reliving that part again, but at a different scale, and et cetera, et cetera. So it seems like an essential tool from what I've learned from you in our conversation is for kind of like getting to the design strategy is actually dealing with the felt experience of the faulty system mm -hmm. at scale and in relationship with each other and in ecological interspecies relationship as well. Like we're not going to be able to be good urbanists if we're not feeling what happens because of urbanism. Mm -hmm. And like that seems to be a major rift in the disciplines that I'm engaged with that is kind of being called to the surface through all of this experience. This has been such an incredible way to spend time with you in these deep conversations. Every time I speak with you, I feel like I'm pushing the walls of my mind and stretching. And it's, yeah, I just appreciate how much you're able to hold and understand and weave together. And I feel like you consider so many things that I know I take for granted every day, things that I just you know, technology and things that I just use without really thinking 
things through or what the phone is even thinking of me. I mean, there's things that you said in this conversation. I'm like, whoa, I have never even considered that. And so I really appreciate the complexity that you are holding and the integrity in which you do so. And it's been so fun to talk to you again. And if there's anything else that you'd like to say, or if you feel complete, it's been, um, yeah, it's been a really wonderful, (sighs) challenging and expansive conversation. Well, thank you, Hannah, so much for the multiple conversations we've had. I'm really grateful that we became friends. And I hope that your listeners' responses and feedback can somehow find their way to me or I can I can learn through their reactions to what they've heard in this conversation because, you know, this is all a process and I'm trying to learn through it as well. So I really appreciate the space that you've been holding for me to be able to think out loud with you. Thank you. Thanks for listening to another episode of For the Wild Podcast. I'm production team member Carter Lou McElroy, and the music you heard today was from South London Hi-Fi, Bad Snacks, and Kenrick. I'd like to thank our host and founder, Ayana Young, as well as the rest of our podcast production team. Aidan McRae, Andrew Storrs, Erica Ekram, Aaron Wise, Francesca Glassbell, Hannah Wilton, and Melanie Younger. If you enjoy today's conversation, please rate us on iTunes or wherever else you get your podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with our projects and offerings, subscribe to our newsletter by visiting forthewild.world slash subscribe.